I worked, <laughs> I worked diligently on this to cut it down to a reasonable time frame. <laughs> For your sake, I tried to do that. Uh, before we get into it, let's pray again. Lord, as we look at your word, uh, we pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. Help us to see what you want us to know. Help us to know you better. And we pray that you would keep us from error. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning's sermon is about prophets and prophecy. And generally speaking, all of us are interested in knowing what the future is. Um, now, generally in a sermon, we expound on a specific passage. We're going to do that. We're going to be in J Jeremiah 28 for most of the sermon. Uh, but before we get there, I want to expand our biblical perspective of prophets and prophecy. Now, at the end, we'll have an application, as we should have. Uh, I know when I prepare a sermon, application is most difficult for me, because I like facts. You know, so the application is difficult for me. But hopefully this application will challenge you. Now, when we talk about prophets and prophecy, we're usually thinking about future events. But... That's not what they always talk about. For example, Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born. Uh, this is you know, a future event, a, an example of prophecy. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Matthew, of course, picks up on this and says, oh, this is the birth of Christ. Uh, another one from Micah, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. The scribes and Pharisees that were working before Herod the Great understood this to mean this is where the Messiah will be born. And then Matthew reports that again. Is this the sum total of what prophets do, is tell about the future? What is a prophet? Prophets do far more forth-telling than foretelling. Far more forth-telling than foretelling. Of course, forth-telling in our current day would be preaching. They're saying what God said. Even our modern dictionaries know this. The Oxford Learner's Dictionary says, a prophet is a person sent by God to teach the people and give them a message from God. That message, of course, may be a prediction of future events, but he gives them a message of God. <laughs> There's a publishing company called Hendricks and Rose and they have a, a pamphlet called Kings and Prophets Timeline. And they have a great description of prophets in there. The prophets were individuals chosen by God to be his messengers to his people, to kings, and even to other nations. Think about Jonah, going to Nineveh. The prophets lived dangerous lives, confronting kings about their sinful ways, and telling hard truths to people who didn't want to hear them. <laughs> Think about Herod Antipas takes his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, and John the Baptist says, this is not lawful. And eventually he loses his head because of it. They didn't want to hear it. The prophets in the Bible proclaim that God is sovereign over all, even the most powerful earthly kings. For example, chapter 4 of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar. And God reduces him to a beast eating uh, grass in the field. 
They remind us that God will bring judgment to those who turn their backs on him and do evil. Yet, God's mercy and grace abound to those who repent and seek him for salvation. Now, let's see if this is true. So here's some examples of forth telling. Judges 6. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of, Israel, uh, of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. Do you see any prophecy in there? None at all. Here's another example from Isaiah 1, starting at 16. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your skins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And now here's an interesting one from First Chronicles. I didn't even think of prophecy in this regard until I was researching. David, together with the commanders of the army, set apart some of the sons of Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun for the ministry of prophesying accompanied by harps, lyres, and cymbals. Singing can be prophecy. I hadn't thought of that before. Now, who were the prophets? First of all, we have writing prophets. Uh, and I don't know if you can see all of these names here. Uh, on the left, you've got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. These are called the major prophets. They're major because the books are long. Isaiah is 66 chapters. On the right, you've got the minor prophets. They are minor because they're shorter books. In fact, in the old scrolls, they were one scroll. And Isaiah was another scroll. So these are the writing prophets. These are the ones you are most familiar with because they wrote these books in the Bible. Uh, other prophets that you probably would add to this list that you know off the top of your head would be Elijah and Elisha. And which order do they come in? Well, chronologically, J in Elijah comes before S in Elisha. Yeah. But there are a lot of prophets mentioned in the Bible. And I'm pretty sure you can't read this list. There, there are a lot of them by name, although there are some, five of them down here, unnamed. We read one of those earlier. Uh, some of them that you might not have added to a list if you had to make up a list uh, would be uh, Moses, or how about um, John the Baptist? He was a prophet for sure. Uh, Saul, King Saul, is mentioned as a prophet several times. Uh, would you have added Jesus to the list? Mm -hmm. yeah. He predicted the fall of Jerusalem. Yeah. He's a prophet. Yeah. So there are a lot of them on there. Now there's one more list of prophets that we need to be aware of. And these are false prophets. So the first one up here is the 450 prophets of Baal that Elijah confronted on Mount Carmel and called down fire from heaven. Um, 
down at the bottom, we've got Balaam. Now he's mentioned as a prophet in Second Peter, but he's way back in the book of Exodus. He's the guy who had a discussion with his donkey. <laughs> the last one here is Bar Jesus. Bar means son. So this guy is calling himself the son of Jesus. He's a false prophet. And uh, his other name is Eliamus, which means magician. And uh, he confronts, or Paul confronts him in the book of Acts, Acts 13. And uh, since he wants to be blind to the Lord, Paul says, you will be blind physically. And boom, it happened right there. All right, now, we've mentioned false prophets. How do you tell the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet? And we go to Jeremiah 28. Beginning at verse 1, in the fifth month of that same year, the fourth year, early in the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, let's stop. What is going on? What's with all these dates and things and who's Zedekiah and all this stuff? We always want to look at context when we're looking at the Bible, right? Context is not only the verses before and after the passage. Context could include culture, history, uh, geography. There's a lot of things that can go into con context. Anything that gives us a clear picture is context. So here's the historical context of what's going on here. In 601 BC, there will not be a test. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar attacks Jerusalem for the first time. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. He takes a bunch of people captive, including Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, you recognize Daniel. These other three guys, you know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you'll find that their names were changed in Daniel chapter 1. Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem a second time. And that was uh, five years, uh, three, four years later, in 597 BC. This is BC, so we're counting backwards. And at that time, he takes away King Jehoiachin, whose father was Jehoiakim. <laughs> and probably he took Ezekiel to Babylon at that time, too. While he was doing this, he made Jehoiachin's uncle the king. The uncle's name was Zedekiah. So in verse 1, this is the fourth year of Zedekiah's reign. So now we're down to 593 BC. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to come back one more time, 586, seven years down the road. And boom, that's the end of Jerusalem. All right, so that's the historical context of what's going on. So let's go back to our passage. In the fifth month of that same year, the fourth year, early in the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, the prophet Hananiah, son of Azur, who was from Gibeon, said to me, he's talking to Jeremiah, in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all the articles of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, removed from here and took to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the other exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So this is what the prophet Hananiah is saying. Now, if you were living in Jerusalem, 
you've experienced Nebuchadnezzar coming and capturing all these important people, carrying them off, would you believe what Hananiah is saying? Is he a true prophet or a false prophet? So first of all, he's using prophetic language. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, and later on declares the Lord. He's using prophetic language. He's prophesying good news. They're going to come back in two years. Um, now, in verse 3 and 4, he says two years, and 4, he's going to bring back all these exiles. Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't want that? As you're going to see, Jeremiah would like that. We're all prone, prone to believe things that benefit us. So, marketing is used to show us things that benefit us, right? <laughs> Would you go to McDonald's if you didn't deserve a break today? <laughs> Would you buy Bounty if you didn't need a quicker picker-upper? <laughs> so we, we like things that benefit us, right? What about when a prominent preacher says that if you give money to him or her or his church, that the Lord will multiply back to you what you've given. Now, I like that you're laughing, you're shaking your heads. I like this. Because in the evangelical community as a whole, nationwide, one in four believe God always rewards true faith with material blessings. <laughs> The good news is the 63 disagree with that statement. But there's another 12% that, well, I'm not sure, maybe he does. 38% say that God will bless them if they donate money. 69% say God wants them to prosper financially. Is that true? Not so sure. <laughs> what if you're told if you just have enough faith, you or a loved one will be healed? So let's think about the faith heroes. Hebrews chapter 11. They had children who rejected God. Examples? Uh, Gideon, Samuel, mm -hmm. they were killed, Isaiah, uh, tradition says he was sawn in two. Uh, how about the disciples? They were killed. All of them except John died from, uh, from the sword or being hung on a cross or whatever. John is the only one that died a natural death. Uh, some of these faith heroes uh, caught diseases. How about Miriam, the sister of Moses? Leprosy. How about Hezekiah, godly king, who was king at the time that Nebuchadnezzar's coming in. Or, no, he's the king when uh, Sennacherib was coming in from Assyria. Different story. Uh, some of these faith heroes have no children. Sarah, Hannah, Elizabeth. Some have all of their plans fall apart. <coughs> Hosea. And some go to jail. John the Baptist. Not to mention the disciples. So when do we believe a prophet and when do we not? This is a critical question. 1 John 4, 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets 
have gone out into the world. Let's go back to our passage, see what we can learn. Verse five, then the prophet Jeremiah replied to the prophet Hananiah. Notice they're both called prophets before the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. He said to them, amen, may the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words you have prophesied by bringing the articles of the Lord's house and all the exiles back to this place from Babylon. That would have been a benefit. And Jeremiah agrees that would be a benefit. <clears throat> Nevertheless, listen to what I have to say in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. From early times, the prophets who preceded you and me have prophesied war, disaster, and plague against many countries and great kingdoms. But the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord only if his prediction comes true. Say what? So in verse 8, Jeremiah is saying the true prophets never prophesy peace without first calling the people to repentance. So you can prophesy that destruction is going to come, and it may come in a long distance off, but it's still a good prophecy, even though it doesn't happen within the prophet's lifetime. Um, in verse, in the next verse, though, Hananiah's prophesying peace without repentance. So what's going on at this time? They're worshiping false idols, and God has about had it. And he's saying, uh, it's okay to worship false idols, not, and not only that, you're going to get peace, too. Jeremiah is saying that Hananiah is a false prophet. Prophets always call the people to repentance. Let's continue on. Then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah and broke it. And he said before all the people, this is what the Lord says. Notice the prophetic language. In the same way, I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, off the neck of all the nations within two years. At this, the prophet Jeremiah went on his way. Now we need a little bit more context here again. So, first of all, a yoke is used to control an animal, right? Uh, we know what they are. We usually think of a double yoke, and we think of uh, Matthew uh, eleven twenty-eight: "Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light." And we think of a double yoke where we're yoked with Jesus. But a yoke is used to control an animal, and therefore, yoke in this con context is saying that Nebuchadnezzar is going to control Israel, Judah, and of course, we should bear the yoke so that God can control us. Now, in chapter 27, Jeremiah is told by God to make a yoke similar to this and wear it in public. Jeremiah is a living, breathing, walking, talking sermon illustration. <laughs> we should be under God's yoke. So now Hananiah breaks Jeremiah's yoke, meaning Jeremiah is the false prophet. Okay, so this is a struggle between prophets, who's true, who's false. So what would you believe if you were living there at the time? You got this crazy man walking around with a yoke, and you got this other prophet who breaks the yoke and says, this ain't gonna come true. What would you believe? Chastisement and punishment are never 
popular or, or pleasant. The yoke was saying, this is not gonna be fun. And Hananiah is saying, it's not gonna happen. Now, at the end of this passage, it says, at this, the prophet Jeremiah went on his way. Why? Seems like Hananiah won, because Jeremiah walks away. We don't know why he walked away, but it could be that he didn't want to be around someone who so arrogantly opposed God's purpose and revealed will. Uh, three chapters earlier, in chap uh, Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah said, by the Lord, the people are going to go into captivity for 70 years. Which, by the way, Ezekiel reads that, interprets it as scripture, and prays for the fulfillment of it. So Jeremiah is recognized as scripture by Ezekiel within a few years. An interesting point. So they're going to serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Hananiah's <laughs> prophecy says, not true. Everybody's coming back in two years. And Jeremiah just doesn't want to stand around someone like this. So maybe he left for that reason. I remember walking away from an, an argument with uh, a guy that I used to work with in a previous lifetime. And uh, I was so angry with what he was saying, and it didn't agree with me, which is why I was angry, that I just walked away from him, which only made him matter. <laughs> um, now, there's a second possibility as to why Jeremiah walked away. He didn't want to say something stupid. He waited for the Lord to give him something to say. Mm -hmm. There's a lesson for us. Uh, James 1.19 says, uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak. So Jeremiah is a, a good example for us to follow. Continuing on in verse 12. After the prophet Hananiah had broken the yoke off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. <clears throat> Go and tell Hananiah, this is what the Lord says. You have broken a wooden yoke, but in its place you will get a yoke of iron. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. I will put an iron yoke on the necks of all these nations to make them serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they will serve him. I will even give him control over the wild animals. Nebuchadnezzar is even going to have control over the wild animals, and God makes him a wild animal for a while. Interesting parallel there. So the reason he's talking about the wooden yoke and the iron yoke, iron yoke is much stronger <laughs> than the wooden yoke, right? That's obvious. And this is an illustration that God's will cannot be thwarted. Notice also, Jeremiah says, going, um, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. And if you go back to what Hananiah said at the beginning, he said the exact same words. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. And that's why false prophecy is so, so critical to understand. Uh, verse 15, then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, listen Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you Yet you have persuaded this nation to trust in lies. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, I am about to remove you from the face of the earth. This very year, you are going to die because you have preached 
rebellion against the Lord. In the seventh month of that same year, Hananiah the prophet died. Now, if you go back to verse one, it's the fifth month. In the seventh month, he died. So Hananiah is prophesying they're going to come back in two years, and in two months, he's dead. Final mark of a true prophet is whether his prophecy comes true. Now, what do I need to know? What do I need to do? Hananiah and Jeremiah use the same words. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Jesus says, by their fruit, you will know them or recognize them. It says that in Matthew 7 and Luke 6. Words are not important. Fruit is important. What do they do? Are they agreeing with Scripture? Now, in the Old Testament, many prophets gave a sign. Okay? This was used to verify that the prophet was speaking for God. Remember, they didn't have all the scripture. So Isaiah 7, 14, a verse you know. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And the New Testament writers recognized that prediction and applied it to Jesus and Mary. In Matthew 24, 24, he says, Jesus says, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. You are the elect. Signs and wonders in an attempt to deceive you. Now, I need to make a theological point here. We believe in a closed canon. Mm -hmm. A canon is a collection of scriptures. It is closed. We are not adding books to the Bible. There are no more books to be added. We're not going to find some letter of Paul in the sands of Arabia somewhere and add it to the scripture. The canon is closed. Scripture is closed. The Bible is complete. Nothing is being added to it. Nothing should be added to it. God has given us his full revelation. Some of you may be thinking about the verse in, in uh, Revelation that says, anyone who adds to the words of the scripture will be anathema. There's a verse in the Old Testament that says the same thing. Can't tell you where it is off the top of my head. So if prophets use signs, what's the sign of the modern prophet? So that we can tell whether they're true or false. Does he quote scripture? Does he quote it accurately? Does he quote it properly? The scripture is God's word. God spoke these words through these writers. So disobeying God's word, the scripture, is the same as disobeying God. <laughs> and any prophet who uses or abuses the scripture, that's part of you will recognize them by their fruit. Now, can you think of anyone who properly quotes and uses scripture. You listen to him almost every week. Mm -hmm. Jared is a prophet. We don't think of him in those terms, but he is. So what should you do? So I have a, a big three list. You've heard it before. Pray, read the Bible, Hang out with other Christians. That's what you should do. Pray, read the Bible, and hang out with other Christians. Uh, I always suggest 
if you're not reading the Bible every day, make a promise that you're going to read it five minutes a day. <clears throat> That's not hard. That's easy. Don't crucify yourself by saying, I'm going to read my Bible five hours a day. You can't do that. Not unless you go cloister yourself in some monastery somewhere. And hang out with other Christians. There's lots of ways to hang out with other Christians. It's not just Sunday morning. We have telephones. Uh, us old people know what those are. <laughs> we have blogs. We have uh, websites that we can go to, such as uh, Bible Gateway. We have recordings. I was just out on Friday with Alistair Begg. <laughs> I was walking along in Hoffman Estates and he was in my ear preaching a sermon from 1992. That's hanging out with other Christians. Make sure you do that and make sure you're reading your Bible and talking to God. You must be connected to the God of our salvation because as Linus reminds us, <laughs> there's no better teacher than the Holy Spirit and no better text than God's word. Biblical prophets always call the people to repentance. False prophets predict peace and prosperity regardless of our spiritual condition. Beware <laughs> preachers who preach only good news. <laughs> and remember, whenever you're talking to someone about God, you're a preacher. You're a prophet. Lord, we pray that as we study your word, as we seek to follow you, that you would empower us as you have promised, that people might know that we have a connection to you and that they might know that they also can have a relationship with you. Speak to us, Lord, and speak through us, Lord, that you might be honored in Jesus' name.